Hallelujah. Tap that mic and it just goes. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, uh, we have announced that we got some prayer cloths that we're going to use and uh, we're going to send out to a lot of people. And so we was going to do it at 10, 15. And of course, we had Brady gripe a little bit because I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's giving me that dirty look like. Uh, but then I got to thinking about it, and I thought, man, it would be great as we film this, as everybody's watching would could get to see Life Changers Church as we in action, as we actually all laid our hands on prayer cloths. So we got prayer cloths all over this front here, and they're already anointed. And so uh, we are going to be sending these out. We're going to be praying that uh, that spirits be broken. We're going to be praying that uh, God begin to uh, touch people's lives and begin to heal them. And we're going to be praying for the COVID-19. Uh, some has has uh, experienced that and lost loved ones, and some has uh, had to go through that. We're not praying for a cure because we already know that we have the cure, but we're praying for people, amen, we're praying for them to be healed. And we got a lot of people who's just in trouble. Uh, and, 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 you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but there's sometimes I just get in trouble, you know, and it and, and just seems like the enemy likes to come on every side of my life. And so sometimes I just need that help. I just need that extra help in my life. We're going to be praying for finances. We're going to be praying for people to be healed. And we're going to be praying for more miracles to, to begin to happen. And so we're going to all take part in this, everybody who would like to. And from one side of this stage all the way to the other, uh, we're going to come and we're going to kneel here at the front at the altar. We're going to lay our hands on it. If you can't touch it, maybe you can touch somebody who is touching or whatever. We're going to spend a little bit of time of praying, and we're going to lay our hands on it, and we're going to send these claws out, and people's lives are going to be healed. How many believe that? Amen. Amen. The, the, the Bible said in the book of Acts that the Apostle Paul handed out uh, aprons and handkerchiefs that he had had wrapped upon him as he began to pray. And, and so the Bible said that it drove out evil spirits. Amen. As he took those handkerchiefs and he took those uh, uh, aprons, as he pulled them out from his body, he, he began to hand them uh, out to people. And so the Bible said that the whole city turned to God because of the anointing. Now, we know that uh, there's nothing special about these claws other than they are a point of contact. Amen. The, the Bible said that, that when the woman with the issue of blood needed a healing, that she crawled on her hands and knees. To where Jesus was, just so she could touch the hem of his garment. And by doing that, the Bible said that she was made whole completely. Years ago, I remember R.W. Shambach. Anybody remember R.W. Shambach? Man, he was my go-to preacher years ago, and uh, still is every now and then. I, I will look up. But, uh, but he was preaching a tent revival, and he said uh, he was praying over prayer cloths, and he was sending them out and said, this lady come up and stood in his line, and uh, he handed her a prayer cloth. And she said, I don't need that. I just need you to pray over these M&Ms. And he said, M&Ms? He said, he, in, in his mind, he, he said, he said, I was wanting to say, lady, <laughs> we got prayer cloths. And, and he, said, he said, well, why don't I give you a prayer cloth? She said, it won't do no good. She said, every Saturday, my husband sits in a lazy boy and he eats M&Ms and he watches football. I want you to pray over these M&Ms. So he did. He anointed them and prayed over the M&Ms. He said about two weeks later, he gets this uh, uh, letter in the mail and said, said I want to tell you that, uh, that my husband was watching football. And she said, I was, I was in the kitchen cooking, and he started crying out. And I thought maybe somebody scored a touchdown. But then she said, I heard him say, oh, God, oh, God. She said, I run in there, and he was knelt down by his lazy boy, and he was saying, Lord, save me. Lord, I want to be saved. Lord, save me. Amen. So, so things like this begin to move. I mean, they begin to happen. Smith Wigglesworth went into a place to preach, and, uh, and he would go into a place to preach, and this is what he would do. He said, I would go in because God told me to, and he said, I'd, sometimes I'd stay three days, and sometimes I'd stay three weeks. He said, but when God would say leave, I would get up and leave. And he said, one day I was, I was, I was laying in bed and uh, the, the, one morning, and he said, souls was getting saved. He said, a demons was being cast out. And he said, it was just one of those times. He said, I got up, and God said, it's time to go. 
He, he said, so I got up and I started leaving. Back in those days when, a, when evangelists would come, they would give them a room. And uh, uh, this in their house, and they say, you could have this guest bedroom. So he said, I was sleeping in there for about two weeks. He said, I got up and started to leave. And he said, the lady of the house chased me down and said, you can't leave. You can't leave. You can't leave. He said, God said leave. She said, you can't because my husband ain't saved. He said, I walked out the door, never skipped a beat. And I said, don't wash the sheets. Praise God. So, so we know that the anointing hangs on things. Amen. It's a tangible thing. It can be touched. And, and, uh, and, and, and so that's where we get the goosebumps from. Because when the anointing comes, it gets all over us. It's a tangible thing. It can be touched. And we can grab a hold of this thing. And we can touch other people's lives. And other people, amen, can be delivered to God. Amen. People can be saved. People can be healed. People can be delivered. I don't know where these prayer clauses are going. We have a lot of people who's asking for them, but they're going all over. These prayer clauses has went as far as Africa. They went as far as uh, as Netherlands, and uh, they they uh, went as far as, as as into Russia and Alaska and all over the United States. As people begin to call, Amen, and they see. And right now, this is the time, Amen. This is the time where God wants to spark revival. And I don't want to leave this out. While we're praying, we're praying for revival. I want the Methodists to have it. I want the Baptists to have it. I want the Presbyterian. I want all of God's people and God's church to, to seek this revival and have this revival. And I want revival to touch people with they didn't want anything. I want people to get prayer claws and walk into the bar and belly up to the bar and just cry. And people think they're drunk and turn around and look and say, I ain't drunk. I'm lost and I need a Savior. Come on, somebody. Body. Amen. And right there in the bar room, just, I mean, just win them all to Jesus. I, I want this prayer cloth to go into some uh, prostitute's purse uh, as she's uh, making that next deal. And when she shuts that motel room, uh, she begins to cry out to God and say, I can't do it. Uh, I want this prayer cloth to go into some junkie's back pocket uh, that when they start to put that needle in their arm, uh, that the only fix they need, uh, I'm about to preach in this place, uh, the only fix they need is Jesus. Uh, I want want this anointing to move and I want the riffraffs. I'm going to preach on the riffraff. That word riffraff means, it means worthless. It means can't be used. It means trash and it means rubbish. I want the riffraffs in this area to grab a hold of God and be anointed of God and God begin to move. Amen. I'm about to get Pentecostal in here. Praise God. Amen. So we want Pastor Anna to sing something or play something and uh, you know, whatever God lays up on the heart, I want you to stand to your feet, if you would, all over this building. Maybe you don't feel comfortable taking part in this. This is okay. You're still part of this, even there at your seat. Uh, you, you are still part of this, whereby no means uh, making it mandatory that anybody needs to come up here for, uh, to the front. But if you'd like to be a part of this, you'd like to lay your hands on this, uh, all, all over this stage, we want you to be a part of that. So while you're standing on your feet, I'm going to commission you and call you Father. In the name of Jesus, every person in this room, God, they've been called by you, and today we commission them. Heavenly Father, today we appoint them. They are anointed and appointed by you. So, Father Lord, as they begin to take these steps to this front today, God, as they begin to take and just begin to lay their hands on these claws, Father, I don't care where their life is right now. I don't care what they see right now. I don't care what's going on in their life. I don't care of all the things, Lord, in their past that's going on at this moment right now. It doesn't matter. Father, what matters, Lord, is right now at this, at this time. Heavenly Father, Lord, we deputize them in the name of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, Lord, that the garrisons... Lord, the garrisons began to move underneath that anointing that called by you. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we take part in this today, God, we are covered underneath that anointing and you began to move and the words that would come out of their mouth, Heavenly Father, as they begin to pray. Lord, maybe they don't have everything right in their life right now. Maybe there's a lot of trouble going on. Maybe there's a lot of confusion. Maybe there's some places in their own life right now, Heavenly Father, that they're trying to get right. Lord, and maybe they come into this place and think, Lord, if I just come in here and just get it right today, then you'll move. Father, I'm declaring right now that you're anointing already in this room. It moves from the top of this building to the bottom, from the side to the side, and from the front to the back, all over this place. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're not calling people saved that isn't saved, but Lord, we're saying that your anointing is going to move upon their lives. Maybe at this altar today while they're praying for somebody else. Manda is shodobo 
They begin to call out to you, Heavenly Father, Lord, and say, I need you. Lord, we thank you right now, Lord, and we ask you that you begin to move. And all over this place, whoever's watching me right now, Father, I pray, God, that you begin to move upon that computer screen, upon that phone, into their houses, into the motel rooms, even driving down the road, maybe in the pasture, maybe on the pond, maybe in the tractor. Heavenly Father, Lord, that you begin to move and grab a hold of their life. This might be the only part of the sermon they see, but Father, reach out right now and begin to touch. Begin to touch them, God. Reach out to them, Lord, and do what only you can do. My God, people, it's here. It's here right now. This anointing is here. It is here now. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Mando soda beke. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Just the blood that streams down. Lord, let it shower. Hallelujah. He's moving in this place. Before we take another step, I want you to get it. I want you to get it. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Here it is. Come here. That right there. Get him to. Come here. Come here. Hallelujah. All right, y'all ready? Y'all ready to be warriors for Jesus? On the count of three all over this building, you want to be a part of this? Amen. Send this out. I want you to come and find you a place. I want you to kneel and pray. We're not putting a time limit on it. We're going to pray until God begins to move. One, two, three. Come on, all over this building.
Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. I got a couple of things on my heart today. And something that the Lord's been dealing with me this past week about. And that's about the, the children that uh, their generation. There, there is a, um, a generational anointing that they're, that they're being birthed into. And, and when they're birthed naturally, there's this generational anointing that's coming up on them. And, and they're going to do the signs and the wonders that the Bible talks about in the end times. And so we need to really expose these children to uh, prayer and the word of God. So this anointing will come forth because it's going to be such a, a natural thing, this anointing. It's a God-given thing that no other generation has had. I mean, we're still going to have our generals and our, and our, our, and our older people of great faith, but, but this generation is a special generation. And I have, I have been listening to some of the older, uh, credible pro, uh, prophetic Bible teachers, and they've been saying, the stage, the stage is set. There's nothing else that needs to be done for the Lord's return. Nothing. It's all ready. And so I just want us to have this mind that we are not looking for an undertaker, but we are looking for the upper taker. Hallelujah. Praise God.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is who you are. Come on, raise your hands in this place. Come on. All over this bill. Hallelujah. Even when I don't see it, you're still working. Let's do that. Just stand on the piano. Oh, just stand. Hallelujah. Keep your hands raised. Just worship him just for a minute. Even when I don't see it, you're working. My goodness. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Come on, Pastor. You never stop. There it is. You never stop working. There it is, right there. You never stop. There it is, right there. Even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you never stop. You never stop working. My goodness, he's here. You never stop. He's here. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You've He's never here. stopped. You've never stopped working. You've never stopped. You've never stopped working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Stop working. You've never stopped. You've never stopped to work. And even when I don't see it, you work. you're watching from home maybe in your vehicle maybe in your office maybe in a private place and you say I don't know Jesus as my personal Savior and you would like to invite him to come into your life take away every part of your life that didn't mean anything put in a part of his life that means everything mix it all together and cause things to work together for the good and I'm calling on you to just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Take me as I am. I want to be yours. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Does anybody under the sound of my voice in this place right here this morning? You would say, preacher, today I want to rededicate my life. Today I want to ask Jesus to come into my life. I'm not, he's here. You want to say, I want to rededicate it. I want to give Jesus my life. I want you to raise your hand and wave it at me. I want to see your hands. I want to see them. I see it. I see it. I see it. Thank you, Jesus. Now I want you to repeat after me, everybody in this building. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. You said that if I believe that Jesus was born of a virgin died on the cross rose on the third day and if I confess him as my savior I will be saved I confess I am bought with a price I am saved come on give him a shout in this place this morning Jesus! 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, take this service. That gifting is not an only that you have given this worship team this morning. God, that anointing that Jesus reached to the coverage of heaven, you just poured out. That prayer that was prayed. Father, we thank you for what we had felt. Now, God, you've softened the heart, you've cushioned the heart, and you got us ready for the word. Now, Father, every person under the sound of my voice today, God, as they would hear me, preach what is upon my heart that you have given me. Whether they've been saved for two days or 20 years, God, infatuate them with your love today. Let them receive today your word. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated in your seats today, this Gospel Sunday. Ain't you so glad you showed up? Look at your neighbor and just tell them you look good in church. <clears throat> Amen. I could have swore I smelt fried taters cooking when I was worshiping a while ago. <laughs> they were trying to distract me. Ain't that, ain't that, I mean, I was looking around like, who is cooking taters? <laughs> and I'm trying to worship. I mean, he, he likes to do those crafty, crazy things. I didn't think I was hungry till I smelt taters. <laughs> <clears throat> he likes to do those things. Remember, that's what he likes to do. He likes to try to pull you away from what you're doing. Isn't it funny how you raise your hands and you begin to worship God, you get your mind off everything, and all of a sudden you remember a bill that hadn't been paid, you remember something you didn't do that locked the door, that let the cat out, that I, you know, all these. And he likes to come in because, see, that's what God does is he comes into the mind. That's why Jesus said, let this mind, that's why the Bible said, let this mind be in you that is in Christ. Amen. That word Christ isn't his last name. It means the anointing. It means teacher. It means Messiah, the anointed one. That's why the, the anointing upon your life. Amen. The Bible said the anointing can break bondages and destroy yokes. So when Jesus came, this is what confused uh, somebody over in Joplin not long ago when I was preaching over and I had a debate for about 45 minutes and finally I just had to walk off. Amen. So I'm not saying this for a debate. I'm just telling you that when Jesus came, he came as Jesus. But when he left, he left as the Christ. Amen. He had to come as a man, but when he left, he left as the Christ, the anointed one. Amen. And so, and so you have to understand that now that anointing is in you. I can do all things through the anointing. Amen. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, but it means the anointing. When you are anointed, there is nothing you cannot do. Listen to me. When you are anointed, there is nothing you cannot do. Amen. And so when that anointing comes upon your life, I, 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 I just want to throw this in here because this is what my daddy told me a long time ago. My daddy used to uh, have to preach to a heathen. Anybody ever been a heathen? <laughs> and he told me this a long time ago, and he said, Roger, when you're praying, and he said, and you get goosebumps, or you're in church and you're praising God and you get goosebumps, he said, notice that that is the anointing that comes on your life. See, you like to think that when I got up, I was anointed. No. <laughs> You would like to think that, but when you press into it, that anointing comes on you, and if you press into it, he's not going to leave you. He's going to come. He's going to show up. But he said when you begin to pray and that anointing comes on your life, he said that is when you start spewing out of your mouth. That's when you start talking crazy things that you would never talk about because when the anointing is there, it's going to happen. See, we can pray up here by faith. You might receive it tomorrow, next week, next month, but under the anointing, you get it now. Let me teach this to you for a minute. Underneath the anointing, you get it now. When that anointing hits your life, it's now. It's not a maybe, it's now. The anointing breaks bondages and destroys yokes. So when you're praising God in praise, when you're praying at home, driving down the road, and you get those chili bumps, those goosey bumps, everybody get those? It's like, whoo, what just happened? Hello? Jesus, just sit down in your vehicle. That's when you say, Jesus, take the wheel. Not literally. 
<laughs> some of you probably needs to. I've seen some of you drive. But, but that's when he sets down at that moment, and that's when the hardest thing for it ever been for you to believe to pray for, start saying it then. Say it then. That's when the people that needs to be saved in your life that isn't saved start saying their name then. That's when the doctor said that you got something that, that cannot be cured, say it then. Yeah. Underneath the anointing, spew it out, say it loud. I don't care, maybe you're in Walmart on the dog food aisle. I don't know about y'all, but he always hits me on the dog food aisle, praise God. I mean, that's when you just say, be saved. You say that underneath the anointing. Sometimes when people come into my line and they say, I want to pray for Myrtle to be saved. I say, okay, and I'm praying all of a sudden God says, Tell them, say, Myrtle, be saved. So when I'm praying for them and the anointing hits me, I lay my hands on them and I say, say, Myrtle, be saved. And they say it. Maybe they're not feeling it, but it's on me. When I touch them, it's going to happen. Listen, that's why we have to understand God has commissioned us. We got to change. We got to change some things. We got to live this thing. Amen. Live it, not dread it, but live it. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to live it. Look at your other neighbor and say, come on, you got to live it. We're going to take up an offering. I, I've got people looking at me. They're ready to give. Praise God. If you have your offering this morning, your tithe, I want to thank you for your tithe. I want to thank you for, for, uh, for that. This is your covenant walk with God. Amen. And uh, this is what God's going to do to you. He's going to be your God. Amen. He's going to be there. He's going to be there through every place in your life. We're not taking up an offering because we need a mortgage payment or we need electric bill or water bill. Amen. We're taking up an offering for you. This is about you. It's not about me, but it's about you. This is the day that we have laid aside at the first of the week, the Bible says, your, your tithe for God. Amen. And so as we begin to give today, this is about you. This is your covenant walk with God. This is where you don't ever lose. Uh-oh. I'll have to teach that later. But listen, this is where you never lose. Anybody ever get money and then at the end of the month you think, where did my money go? I've been there sometimes. This is where you don't never lose. Now, now sometimes you think, well, how in the world did I make my month's bill? I don't understand. I didn't make no more money. But, man, it's like I got money left over. It's because Malachi 3 and 10 says he will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Devourer means seed eater. So when you come underneath the covenant tithe, he rebukes Satan so you don't lose anything. You just start getting stuff. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this offering today. We thank you as they begin to give. We ask you, Lord, that you'd bless the hands and the feet. In Jesus' name, amen. You may come at this time and give. Give with a cheerful heart. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, where can I get one of them shirts? <laughs> I love my wife, too. I need one of those. He's going to call me Monday, and he's going to, he is. <laughs> he said, you better be glad you're on that stage of that microphone. <clears throat> Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you this morning. I, I, I want to tell you, I'm going to be preaching on the riffraff. I want to tell you a funny story about this. I was telling Linda. The older I get, my eyes kind of get, you know, they're not really good. And so uh, a lot of times when I'm driving down the road, I will put my phone up and I will just turn it on play and it'll come to my speaker and just read to me, you know, and, and I just, I'm just getting that reading going down the road and, and stuff. And so anyway, uh, I was going to, you know, getting studied up and stuff and, you know, read a little bit. I was going to refresh myself. And so I was going to go hit Joshua 11, but evidently I hit Judges 11. I couldn't see it. So I started reading this story and I thought, man, I don't remember this story in Joshua, oh, but I remember it. I mean, I know it. And, I, and so I still didn't dawn on me. Boy, I've studied, studied. <laughs> and about a few days ago, I thought, oh, no, I studied the wrong book. <laughs> so, Lord, let me go back. And God said, no. You thought you did it on accident, but he said, I purposely brought you here. Amen. And so all this week I've been uh, talking. In this story here, this is the story of the man by the name of Jephthah. Jephthah was one of the judges in Israel. That's why it's in the book of Judges. Hello. Uh, he was one of the judges. Before there was kings, 
God had men that was judges. Samuel or, or, or Samson was, was, uh, was a judge. And uh, Samuel was a judge. He was the last judge before he appointed Saul to become king. And so he was the last judge of Israel. And so for many years, God would have prophets or men who would stand out and they would tell Israel, this is where we're going to go. This is how you're going to do it. And, uh, and so if they didn't do it, then, you know, they, they would pray and God would, you know, do what he does. <laughs> Amen. It's going to be a hard crowd. We're going to get through this. Okay. <laughs> so at one point, Samuel, the Bible said that not one word that come out of his mouth touched the ground. Now, I don't know about you, but that is something right there. Because it seems like I talk all day long, <laughs> and it's like every word I hit just hits the ground, don't go nowhere. I said, Lord, let me be like Samuel in the name of Jesus. But not, the Bible said not one word, listen to me, not one word that come out of his mouth touched the ground. So that means it's still circulating today. That means that when Christ got a hold of it, he's still slinging that word around. Samuel was so powerful as a judge that the Bible said that when Samuel would come into town that the elders of the church would shake underneath conviction because they knew that a man of God was coming. Wouldn't it be amazing today, praise God, when people drove by here and looked at Life Changers Church and thought, ooh, God doing something. It's almost like a lot of people make fun of the church today. And we sit back, and what is wrong with it is that the church hadn't tapped into the power of knowing who Christ is and doing what Christ has called us to do. Quit worrying about your petty mistakes. Look at your neighbor and say, that's for you. Quit worrying about your petty mistakes. Shake yourself, get back on track, and do what God has called you to do. That's what, that's what men of God do. So Jephthah was one of the judges, and the story of Jephthah, and it, it, it tells us right off the bat, and I'm going to read out of the Message Bible because it's got a word in there that I'm going to preach. So let me read this, and I'm going to kind of give a recap here, and we're going to come back, and I'm going to preach this. Can I preach this morning? Yes. The Bible says Jephthah, the Gileadite, was one tough warrior. Amen. Y'all ready for this? He was a son of a... And out of the mouth of babes. Come on. <laughs> well, I thought I picked a good version of this. <laughs> and he was the son of a... <laughs> but Gilead was his father. Boy, this is going to be a good day. Y'all, y'all, are y'all ready? Will it be all right if I go like 1230? Is that Okay. Three people. Come on. <laughs> the Bible said two or three. Amen. Okay. But Gilead was his father. Meanwhile, Gilead's legal wife had given him other sons. And when they grew up, his wife's sons threw Jephthah out. They told him, You're not getting any of our family's inheritance. You're the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and went to live in the land of Tob. Some riffraff, oh, I love it. I'm going to preach on that. Some riffraff joined him and went around with him. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, let your word, God, be established in this place today. Touch people's lives. God began to move, maintain that relationship, strengthen that relationship. When we walk out of this place today, Heavenly Father, know that we have heard from you. And God, you began to move. Lord, you touch the ones that are at home. You touch the ones that are here. Let your spirit and your glory, everything that's already happened in this place this morning, we can shut the doors and walk out and say we had church. But Father, we want to go deeper. We want to gather deeper. We're going deeper. We're not just going to get a little bit. Heavenly Father, Lord, but we're going to get. We're we're going to get all we can, and we're going to can all we get. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. My daddy used to say, get all you can and can all you get. Preserve it. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to preserve this morning. Preserve. Amen. So this story of Jephthah, I'm, I'm just going to kind of do a little recap here because there's a lot of this that I'm really not going to talk about. I, 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 I was really 
wanting to this morning, but I know where God wants me to stay. I'm going to stay in that. But when you read this story, this is a story of Jephthah. This is a man who'd been kicked out because his mother was a prostitute. And so his daddy went to another woman. She bare a child. She brought Jephthah. She dropped him off at his daddy's house, and she left. And so his wife had more children. And so after that, when they grew up, they kicked him out and throwed him out and said, you're not a part of this family because you have another uh, mama, and, and she is not our mama, and even though you have a legal father, that, that there's Gilead, he made a mistake. How many knows that there's a lot of things in your life that you think that are mistakes, but God can take things? Because if all things work together, come on, somebody. If all things, not some things, not a little bit of things, but all things, everything. Look at your neighbor and say everything. God can take it. Because he knows the end of your story, not the beginning. God's not speaking to now, just right now. He's not talking to you right here, because right here we can do that. He's talking to you way down yonder. <laughs> yonder, that's an Oklahoma word, way down yonder. He's talking to you over there, because over there you cannot see and you don't understand it, but God does. And that's why we struggle with what God's saying to us a lot of times, because it seems foreign. It seems, well, I don't know, Lord, that's just not me. I can't do that. I remember when God called me to preach, I said, huh, I ain't doing it. I can't wear those suits. I can't wear those ties. I am not going to do that, and I ain't cutting my hair. Be like Samson. I'm just going to grow it out, Lord. That's where the anointing is. I couldn't see that part of it. Lord, I don't want to do that. I just want to be like this, but God wasn't speaking to the now. He was speaking to the future. My wife loved my mullet. She was sad when I cut it. <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble. So Jephthah leaves, and the Bible said he gets with another man. This another man that he's running around with is a riffraff. You know, riffraff means worthless. It means, uh, it, it, it means trash. It means garbage. It means rubbish. It, it, it means something that, that, uh, that is no good. So he's hanging around something that is no good, and out of the no good, the Bible said that now they come to Gilead after they've been attacked by all the armies, the Ammonites and those around. They come to him, and they gather up, and they say, will you come back and fight? Because they knew he was a warrior. The Bible said, uh, if, if it was me writing it, I would say he is bad to the bone. He was a mighty warrior. He was a man that he would get up in, a, I mean, he would fight you. I believe that's why they looked at him. They were scared of him. I said, man, why are you like that? Well, because God had plans. Come on, somebody. Somebody says, well, I don't know why I was raised like that. I don't know why I was raised in a home like that. I don't know why I was raised being abusive by my dad or by my mom. I don't know why nobody wanted me. I don't know why that they just put me up for adoption. I, I don't know why everybody hated me. I don't know why. Well, let me tell you something. Quit asking God why and start thanking God that he called you. He called you in the middle of the riffraff. He called you when everything didn't look good. He didn't wait till you had your Sunday clothes on and said, I want you. He called you with alcohol on your breath. He called you while you still had crank breath. He called you while everything was messed up. He called you when nobody else would come and get you. He found you when nobody else cared where you was at. He came to the land of Tob, to the dry places, and found you. The Bible said he went to the city of Tob. He went into the dry place, the barren place, the place that doesn't produce. Ain't you so glad that God ain't scared about the places that doesn't produce? Ain't you glad that God comes anyhow? So he goes to the land of Tom, uh, Todd, Tom, Tom, excuse me, Tom, to the barren place. And out of the barren place, the Bible said the messengers came and God had been asking, and he said, can I be? The head, can I be the judge? And they said, yes. When you read this story, they said, yes, you can be the judge. Here's where the Bible doesn't leave anything out. Here's where you got to understand. You can't just read the Bible as a story time and just say, oh, sometimes you got to literally just take this word and read it as it is, and it's going to shock you. It's going to be better than a soap opera, I guarantee you. 
I mean, it, I mean, it, 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 it's full. It's full of people who 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 who, who, who have misunderstood God, or mad at God, or run away from God, or did crazy things. It's full of those. And in this story, this is one of those stories where you read, where you look at, and you think, man. Because the Bible said that Jephthah began to call out to God, and he said, if you will anoint me. I was once in the family and I've been kicked out, but if you'll anoint me and give me this and let me defeat these, these enemies around me. He said, Lord, when I get home, the very first thing that comes out of my house, I'll sacrifice to you. The Bible said when he gets home, his only daughter runs out of the house. He says, Daddy. The Bible said he got off his mule. He ripped his clothes. He said, God, why? Ripped his clothes in despair and cried out, why? He See, when you read this story, and I'm not going to talk about this a whole lot because a lot about this that I don't understand. But I can tell you this, that God has a plan. If God didn't want us to read this, it wouldn't be an inspired word of God. There's a lot of places you can go to it, but you understand that God did not like human sacrifice. The, 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 the Moabites was one of the first uh, uh, nations uh, that, every, uh, that, 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 that ever had abortion. And they would take an unborn child out of the mother's womb uh, and put it in the fire and sacrifice to the God of Chemos. And God didn't like that. Matter of fact, he put it in his law, you should not put none of your sons to walk through the fire. In other words, to sacrifice. No human sacrifice. But still yet, God tells Abraham, Lord, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, take him to the mountain and sacrifice him for me. But this story gives us a good end. It says God stopped him. God stopped him. The Bible said God provided in this story of Judges, it doesn't give us an answer. It doesn't say God provides. It just drops off, just bam, just stop. Don't you hate it when that happens? It just shuts the door and ends and, and doesn't give you an explanation. Just shuts the door. Now, I don't know, some theologians, and I said I wasn't going to get off on this, but no one's here. Some theologians will say that, that, uh, that after she went through and she began to call out, maybe she become like Samuel, and, and since he vowed, maybe he gave her to the priest. Maybe she grew up, maybe she was the very first ever nun. I don't know. I'm saying, oh, it can't be nun because they're Catholic. We're Pentecostal. <laughs> you know, I don't, I, I really don't know, and I wish I could give you a better explanation, but I don't know all about this story, but I know that the goodness of God and the grace of God, but I know that at this moment, here's Jephthah standing in his yard, and his only son, only daughter, when you read this story, the Bible said that his only daughter came out to greet him, and he realized the vow that he made. What I want to tell you is, is, is listen, uh, there is anointing that is coming upon this world today. And I want to hear, tell you something right now. It ain't coming to the goody two-shoes of the church. It's coming to the riffraffs. Those uh, that will be bold enough uh, to vow a vow and go through it. Those that will stand up uh, and say, I'll fight you on the backside or I'll fight you on the inside. Those that will tell you, I'll fight you from the pulpit to the pew, but I'm not going to walk out of here and not fight a devil. I'm going to fight a devil and one of us is going to get dirty. God's looking for the riffraffs. He's looking for those uh, that will stand up. Too many times we'll try to be cute about it. Uh, too many times we just want to stand over and want to say, well, uh, you know, I don't know, but we're going to let God handle it. And God says, I already handled it. Uh, now I want you to believe me uh, and stand out and do it. Now listen, don't go out on the streets and hit somebody in the mouth. I'm not saying go fight somebody today. Them people ain't your enemy. Your enemy is the enemy. Satan, he is your enemy. And Satan attacks you when you're the weakest. You think he's going to attack you right now while you're getting the word of God? And you know he's, he's going to wait until you go home and hadn't read your Bible for two days. They're like Sanford and Son. I'm coming, Lord. <laughs> some of you went over your head, but some of you know what I'm talking about. 
What? You mean I got to read my Bible every day? Every day. Every day. I like that word, every day. We was in Nashville, Tennessee going to a deal. I mean, a bunch of us was riding our bike. It was hot. I mean, it was like 98 degrees. I mean, heat index was like 107. And I mean, we, we was in traffic jam. We was having to go. And I mean, it was hot. I was like, mm. Looked over in the highway trail on his motorcycle. Come over. He pulled up beside us. I mean, we was going, hitting the clutch and stopping. I saw Blanc had, and he just pulled up and had that motorcycle. He never put his foot down. He just took his front wheel and did this. Looked like he just standing up. And I thought, what? And I said, you do this all the time? He said, every day. <laughs> <laughs> every day. I said, he's southern. So I told my wife, I said, we're going to try that. She said, I'm getting off. <laughs> you ain't doing that with me on this bike. <laughs> I was wondering how he's, I mean, just like he's standing anyway. That's the, but. <clears throat> so we have to understand that what God is doing in this story, what I want to produce to you this morning in this message is for you to understand that there are places in your life where it doesn't make sense. There are things going on in your life and there was places, I don't know about you, but there's phases of your life that you really wish you could forget about. And some of you that are sitting in this room today, God, God, God's pulling you from it, but the enemy is reminding you on a daily basis of what you did. He's playing tricks on your mind. He's telling you what you put your family through. He's telling you where you've been and he's telling you that you're not going to get out of it. But God is saying, I call the riffraffs. God is saying there were some things in your life that took place that doesn't make sense. But he says, I take the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And while they don't understand it, God says, I have a plan. I have a place figured out for you. Jephthah was going to become a judge, and in the middle of it, all his other sons had the legal right. They had everything set down to step in line and become it. And because his mother was a prostitute, and because his daddy was Gilead, God still knew what he was doing, and he moved in the process of it and said, this is the one I want. Now, nobody else wants him. He's running around with some riffraffs, with a bunch of worthless things, I'm going to take my anointing to the worthless place. Whew, ain't you so glad? I'm going to take my anointing to the worthless place. I was in Waco, Texas at the Howard Johnson Inn Motel in 1993. I laying there in that motel messed up out of my mind. I mean, drunk and, and, and doped up and sitting there and, and knowing what, working 80 hours a week and having to get up at 7 o'clock and not going to bed till 2 or 3 o'clock in other mornings. I was laying there in that motel. I was tired. I was tired of fighting. I was tired of running. I, I knew mom and daddy was praying. Praise God, this is for cell phones. Every now and then when I'd have a bad time, I'd pull up to a pay phone and I'd call home. And mama would say, Roger, I'm praying for you. Roger, I'm praying for you. I was laying in that motel. There wasn't a cell. There, there wasn't a phone booth nowhere. I remember, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of doing what I'm doing. I don't know what to do. Lord, I'm hanging around everybody, and all they want to do is drink. All they want to do is party. All they want to do is smoke. I don't know what to do, Lord. I'm stuck. I'm in a place. I'm in a bunch of riffraff, and I don't understand it. And so one night, about 3.30 in the morning, I turned on TV. TBN. I, I turned it on and lo and behold, R.W. Shambach on the other side with that microphone. He said, you laid up in that motel and you called the preach. I tell you now, get out of the bed and repent. And I did. My cousin laying on the other side. His daddy's a Pentecostal preacher. He's laying on the other side. I start calling out, God, I need you, Lord. Lord, if there's ever time I need you, I need you now. Lord, save me. Save my soul. Just crying out. He wakes up and says, what are you on? I said, I'm on Jesus. Get out of bed and let's repent. Let's do this together. He said, no, nah, I'll do it tomorrow. 
God next day didn't even remember what was going on. God next day sobers everything. I, I remember what, what had went on. I, I remember that even in the state that I was in, hanging around riffraffs, hanging around in worthless places, hanging around to a place I didn't know. I don't know who I'm talking to, but this is an evangelistic message. And I need to tell somebody, you've been running from God. You tried God once. You tried him twice. You tried him a dozen times. You're sick and tired of coming back and just and going back on your word. You come to church and you get out of church. You do good and then you don't do good. And the riffraffs are pulling you. But I'm telling you now that God has got a place. He's calling you. There is an answer to your problem today and that problem is Jesus. He's calling you out of the riffraffs. He's calling you out of the worthless place and he's putting you now. He's putting you now. This is your time. This is your time. He's calling you now. This is your time. Everything else doesn't make sense. Everything went in your life doesn't make any sense. But he's calling you. He's calling you. He's calling you now. He's calling you in a motel room. He's calling you when everything doesn't make sense. He's not healing everything that needs to be healed. But he's calling you. He's putting a calling on your life. He's calling you out in the middle of it. He's telling you he ain't worried about your problems because he's a problem solver. But what he's telling you is I'm going to call you in the middle of everything that doesn't sound good. That doesn't look good. Get out preaching this place this morning. He's telling you he's calling you to higher places. He's not waiting on you to get it right. He's not waiting on you to change everything. He's calling you. Praise God. Ain't you so glad? I'm glad when I read in that story when Jesus began to walk by and he looked at the blind man. He could have looked at him and said, I want you to see in my name. But, but he didn't. He rests down by the water and he took some mud or took some dirt in his hands and he spit. And he rubbed that together and rubbed that mud on his eyes. When I get to looking at that and reading that, I'm thinking, my goodness, that's the DNA of God. All in that mud. Woo. Well, there's old muddy eyes. You can call me what you want to, but the DNA is there, praise God. Well, he's a nut. I might be, but I'm hanging on the right tree, baby. And I'm telling you right now, God is moving. He is pulling us in, and he is telling us that this is it. COVID-19 has really looked like it's harmed the church, but look deep down. He's calling the riffraffs. He's going into the worthless places. The church didn't have church, and some of them still ain't having church. He don't need a church to call. Them, he'll send them out into the bars. He'll go to the riffraff places. He'll call them because they've been called. Well, my mama's a prostitute. It doesn't matter. You've been called. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what they say about you. It doesn't matter the places in your life. I'm telling you now, God has called you. He's called you to go take out the enemy. He's called you to take out the enemy that Israel couldn't take out. He's called you because the secret relies in you. Because the secret thing is in you. It looks like the world has covered it up. It looks like the world has lied to you. It looks like you'll never make it. It looks like they'll never come back to God. It looks like that it's all falling to pieces. But God's got a plan. Come on, somebody. God's got a plan. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for your family's life. He's not leaving you like that. God ain't going to leave you there. Look at your neighbor and say, God won't leave you there. Not going to leave you like that. Not going to leave you life in a mess like that. God is calling. In this story, I could go into a lot of different things, but I need to tell you something. That when I read this story, and it was completely by accident trying to get to, to, to Joshua chapter 11. Well, I thought it was accident, and I remember now. There's no such word in the Hebrew language as accident. You cannot find the word accident in the Hebrew language, but you can find the word purpose. See, God's language, there is no such thing as accident. But there is a word called purpose. How about we just get up and live for God on purpose? I don't go to church because it's Sunday and I'm religious. I go to church on purpose. I want to give the devil a black eye. I want everybody to know. 
I'm radical for Jesus. I want them all to know that I didn't quit dancing. I just switched partners, baby, and I'm still dancing. That's where I stand at. Some of y'all look up, look up where a wall ago, and I was moving to the left and moving to the right, and y'all was thinking, ooh, he can electric slide. Ooh. I didn't ever forget all that. Praise God. I still dance for Jesus. Some of y'all was thinking, I wish I could get up there with him. But no, you don't want nobody to think that you're too radical. Uh-oh. See, here's the thing. We want to do a little bit, but when God takes the riffraffs, you know what they do? They don't care. They don't care if you like it or not because you didn't see them before. God did. You didn't see the other lie. God did. You didn't come and get them. God did. And so they're going to live for God. You hear me and mark my words. God is pouring out a riff-raff anointing upon the church. And he's calling the worthless that the world is calling them. And God is putting valuable inside of their lives. Yeah. Funny thing about the glory and the power of God that God told him. He said, he said, I want you to build me a tent. I want you to set my presence, the Ark of Covenant, in this tent. And I want you to pick this tent up and move it. And I want you to move it. Everywhere, I, everywhere this cloud goes, I want you to move it. And I, want to, I want to be in that place. They would go up and they would set up the tent. And everybody else that would come by, they'd look at that tent. And they'd think, man, what a pitiful shack. What a pitiful shack. Because on the outside, it didn't look like anything. But on the inside, it was lined with gold. And not just anybody could get to the inside. But those that was called to follow God could get to the inside. See, but on the outside, it was nothing. It was absolutely nothing. It just looked like just a shack sitting there. But see, that's why the Bible said that he looks to the inside of a man, not the outside of a man. That's why the Bible says that, 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 that even in my mother's womb, I was called. After your mother was a prostitute, did God call you? Yeah. Ooh. Let me tell you something. God's saving prostitutes. Don't you, don't you think right now that God can't save pimps and he can't save prostitutes because he can. Praise God. I remember uh, years ago, me and Anna just started preaching. And I hadn't been preaching very long. I started preaching 300 days out of a year and started traveling in certain organizations and denominations. I'm not going to say any names wanted me to come in and become the national evangelist. I'll give you a salary. We'll pay for this. We'll pay for that. You just go. And I mean, I'm telling you, it sounded good because because when I started, I knew nobody. I had to borrow money to get to a revival to put gas in my vehicle. And then one time I got to revival, and you know what they give me as an offering? A Dr. Pepper. Woo. You know what I did? I just thank God for it because I was thirsty. Before I left, a man walked up and said, I showed up late and, 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 and put a $100 bill on my hand. It was like $5,000. So, man, this sounded good, man. I mean, they're going to book me. I don't have to book. I don't have to worry about it. All I got to do is travel. I just got to travel. And I was sitting there. I was praying. And God said, I didn't call you to do that. God said, they're trying to be your pimp. I want you to get up and walk out. Ain't nobody going to pimp you. You ain't called for that. I walked into that overseer's office. And I looked at him right in the eyeball after I took their national test. I hadn't even been to school at that time and passed it by 97. They said, man, what's going on? I said, when nobody knew, I was in. I I was in the den of my mother-in-law's house. When me and Anna didn't have a house to live in, my mother-in-law loved me enough. That, that, that's something to say, that your mother-in-law loves you and put us in a house. I would go in, in that den and I would crawl on my face and cry like a baby and cry until the carpet was nothing but wet. I would pray until I was sweated through my clothes. I would get up and seek and pray and seek and pray and seek and pray and read. And God began to move. When I took that test, he said, what school did you go to? I said, the school of nothing seems to be happening. Praise God. I'm praying, but God ain't doing nothing. Have you anybody ever been there? The school of nothing seems to be happening. 
I'm fasting and God ain't doing nothing. I'm praying and God ain't doing nothing. I'm asking God and ain't God ain't doing nothing. I've been, I've been to that place. I, I walked in that overseer. I, I, I put the papers on his desk and I said, you know what? I said, I'm not a prostitute and you're not my pimp. I am not going to do this because God called me in this direction. I want you to know that was the best decision I ever made, but it was the hardest decision. And I'm here to tell you right now that God is taking the riff laughs like me and like you and putting anointing in your life and telling you you can change this thing. You can turn this thing around. Jephthah begins to come back to God knowing where he came from, knowing that his mother was a prostitute, knowing that his dad had went out and got a hold of another woman, knowing that he was a mistake, should never happen, knowing that his mother didn't want to change, didn't want to give it up, so she left him for, 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 uh, for his dad to raise. And now he's been raised. Have you ever thought about King David, red-headed, freckle-faced, look like Opie? Hebrew boys ain't red-headed and freckle-faced. They're brown-headed and black-eyed and dark-skinned. It's because his father went across to another place and laid with another woman. And so Jesse now is not. Now Jesse, now Jesse's got, got a child. And, 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 so now, and so now David, he's been putting out in the field while all his other brothers are doing the good things. And guess where God came to? He came to the riffraff. Come on, somebody. Uh, I know you're going to walk out of this place and you're going to look at somebody and say, I'm a riffraff, praise God. And you're going to be proud of it. And they're going to think you lost your mind. And you're going to say, but you don't know where I came from. If you knew where I came from, you would shout with me. If you knew where God raised me from, you would shout with me. If you knew where I got up and should have died, you would have shout with me. I need somebody to stand on their feet and give God a crazy praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, he's preaching to you. So we got to be driven to do the work of God. We have already proved to ourselves that just getting saved and come to church don't do it. Because getting saved and come to church, we get lazy. We get hooked on a schedule. It's easy. It's called Cadillac. So we know that we got to be a part of the riffraff. We know that deep down, every one of you, there's a riffraff somewhere in you that God has moved. I'm sparking something in your life. Every one of you understand and you know. I, I know that there's some places in your life that you wish you could take back. But God says, don't touch that. Leave that alone. I was with you in the middle of that. You didn't see me, but I was with you. You didn't know, but your mama prayed. But your grandma prayed. But your granddaddy prayed. You didn't know, but somebody handed you a prayer cloth and stuck it in your glove box. Somebody put a prayer cloth in your toolbox. Come on, somebody. Somebody went to church and cared about you and prayed for you. And in the riffraff days of your life, I have called you in the middle of it. I've called you to defeat enemies in your family that nobody else has ever been able to defeat. Some of you are sitting right here and the biggest problem you got right now is family. Y'all know I'm telling y'all the truth. That's the biggest problem y'all got. That's what keeps y'all awake most of every time is your family. Your family. And there's something so anointed about it in that riffraff place of your life and you're struggling with it. But what you need to do is you need to hold your head up and you need to get ready because what God is about to do to your family is he's about to move in a mighty way. Praise God. I remember the story of Jabez. The Bible says in, in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse number 10 and 11, how many talking about all the genealogies and going down and so-and-so begets so-and-so and begets so-and-so and so-and-so begets so-and-so in two verses right up in the middle of it. And 
Jabez was more honorable than all his brethren. Then his mother called him Jabez. And Jabez began to pray that the Lord would bless him and, and, and move upon his territory and increase it. And the Bible said, and God blessed him as he prayed. And then it goes right into the begets. And Jabez, that word Jabez means pain. His mother bore him in pain. I don't know what happened. Maybe a war went on. And maybe she was pregnant when her husband and their other sons went out to war. And they died on the battlefield. And they came back. And, 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 and they wasn't there. And she and he, and he was born in a process of pain. And his mother couldn't deal with it anymore. And she said, all I got is pain. I'm going to name this child Jabez. I'm going to name him pain. It's almost like Johnny Cash. The boy named Sue. Now you're going to school and your name is pain. Not major pain, but pain. Going to school and now your name is pain. And all the other kids are laughing at you and making fun of you. But still yet, God has a promise. I don't understand this. Take me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 32. I don't understand it either, but I know that when you make the hall of faith, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson. <sighs> Ain't that the man who sacrificed his daughter? Now I got y'all serious. Y'all say, tell me more. Is that? And he made? The hall of faith? Isn't it amazing how the craziest place in his life that later God would say, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel. He's noted up among the great men of God in the hall of faith. Well, all we can remember is how. Isn't it amazing how you don't know the next door neighbor, but you remember that when they was in high school, they robbed a the liquor store? I don't know their name, but remember that time? You don't know the person across the street, but you remember while they was in high school, they got pregnant. I don't know her name, but you, you remember Who's Jetta? Oh, he's the one to come home. And his daughter came out. And he had to vow her to the Lord. In the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, he's a pillar of faith. Now, what I'm trying to tell you in this place this morning is all your pain and all your stuff that you've been dragging yourself through and beating yourself up and trying to pull yourself up out of bed, trying to put a smack smile on a smile on your face and trying to make ends meet and just scuffling and just trying to get through and you don't understand it and there's too much of your life that doesn't make sense and there's more bad than there is good. I'm telling you, Riff Raff, right now, God is coming to you. He's calling you. He's going to find you and he's setting you up. This is it. This is why you didn't die in that car wreck. This is why you didn't take your life while you have those suicidal thoughts. This is it. God saved you for now. God kept you now. This is why you didn't lose your mind when you went through that divorce. This is why you didn't lose your mind in that part of your life when you was drugged out. I know, I don't know, but somebody needs to hear me this morning. God has found you in the riffraff. I should have died in Dallas Hospital. <coughs> Overdosed. Should have lost my life when the gun was pulled on me in Waco, Texas. Should have never made it when I flipped my truck over the bridge in Atoka, Oklahoma. I don't understand a lot of what's going on in my life. Sitting in a motel room in, in, in Bentonville, Arkansas. Bleeding every time I'd go to the stool. For months and months. And the enemy fighting my mind and telling me I'm going to die. 
Didn't even tell my wife. Didn't even believe. Any, what the enemy is saying, I just kept my mind focused. Kept praying for people. People getting healed. I don't even remember other than I was walking out of the church in Bentonville, Arkansas. God said, you're healed. Listen, I know, I know this is crazy. Y'all bear with me. Say, I love the preacher. I couldn't wait to go back to Motel 8 and have a bowel movement. Because I wanted to prove I was healed. Guess what? I was. See, there's a lot of things and a lot of places in my life and in your life that you can count and look back on and say, Lord, why did this happen? And God says, because I had to come to this place in your life and I wanted uh, that part of your life to be a testimony. I'm not saying that you should have. I'm not saying that's the best thing you ought to do. I'm not saying everybody I, I, I get out of church and become an outlaw. I'm telling you now that in your outlaw days, you didn't die. I'm telling you now that God moved upon your life and he's got you now. And now, what is now? 2020. When everybody is shut in, God's saying, I want to use you. I want to use your testimony. I want to use your broken down places. I, I want to use uh, those places in your life, and I want to build upon them. Don't ever count out what God is doing. Pass around the come piano, please. God is moving in directions. God is touching people's lives. Right now as we speak, somebody's hearing. Somebody will hear tomorrow or the day after, but they're going to hear. You are going to understand that today you was appointed to be here. It was by no accident. Because God wants to take your life, right now, your life. He wants to use it for good. He wants to use this for good. I... When I read the Bible, I understand a lot of different things that God began to do, some major things. But I know that God has promised us a revival. He said in the book of Habakkuk, Hab Habakkuk, he said, I will shake everything that can be shaken. Listen, listen. He said, I will shake everything that can be shaken. You know, that old lion devil, you know what he likes to do? He likes just to lay dormant. I mean, all that stuff you went through as a kid, through your high school years, man, you made it, your college years, you was fine. Got children, 35 years old, and bam. Just crazy things start happening. <laughs> the enemy just lays dormant, just, just, just lays until a certain time. And he starts bringing back all the stuff that you went through. And why did this happen? I don't understand this. Why did I lose this person in my life? Why did this person die in the car wreck? Why did this person have to die of cancer? Why did I lose, lose my dad? Why did I lose my mom? Why, why, why did I go? All of a sudden, the enemy lays dormant. David is prime example. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 10 that while Israel was at war, David rested. Walked out on the rooftop to look down to see Bathsheba. David should have been at war, but the enemy sat back, lay dormant. He'd come against the thing that David liked the most, and that was young women. He used that as his weakness while he got slowed down and weak. Come upon his life. See, what I want you to hear me this morning is I want you to know that there is a place that God has called you from, but you got to understand this, when He's called you, He hasn't perfected you. But He's telling you that there's hope. He's telling you don't rely on you. You can't rely on you. I'm going to say it again. You can't rely on you. It's not you, boo. 
It's Jesus. Don't rely on you. When you are weak, he's strong. Every head bow. All over this place. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. All over this 